Good evening. Better? Uh, my name is Daniel Chafing. I'm the program coordinator at the Goethe Institute Los Angeles. And I have the unique pleasure and honor to introduce three people, two of which you saw on the screen who are here tonight. First is uh, Director Remy Kessler. Mel Tilakaratna, who's coming up right now. And Rudy Salinas. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me talk, and Remy actually already answered the first question that I was going to ask him in his introduction. So I'm pretty much going to turn it over to Remy and to Mel, and to Rudy, and everybody here in the audience. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, don't need to introduce those two guys. And uh, I mean, if you have questions, I think that it's the most, uh, most interesting thing is to uh, ask the question and see if we can answer. Has anyone had any question? Who say I do? But it's basically, my, my, it's basically, uh, it's basic. The, uh, a statement that I'm glad I found out who will make those sandwiches at Burger King. Those sandwiches that you go out, that's Burger King, right? <laughs> huh? No, I don't know who made those. Oh, the people that I see the people around that round table making those sandwiches, but I didn't know where they was going. Yeah, that was that was our group. We yeah, I always be across the street yeah. when they had the store there, and I'd be saying, "Wow, isn't that amazing? Whatever they're doing, and I don't know where you're going." But now I see what the team was doing. They was taking them out to feed uh, people, the homeless people. I think the film is fabulous. I I was homeless myself for eight years, and it took a lot of work to get help. And it works like that, move, like your movie. It takes a lot of people that care about you because someone cared about me and they kept working with me. And after 25 years of clean and sober, they are still overseeing me and to make sure that I'm doing fine because all it takes is one wrong moment in my life to screw up. So that I know that movie is just so real and it's, it takes a lot of work. And you did a magnificent job. I mean, I can feel your feelings about helping someone because I saw it in the eyes of the person that was helping me. And it wasn't easy. Sometimes I had to get in the car and go to legal aid with them because it was very difficult even to talk with legal aid. You know, they don't believe. They have to see right on spot. Who are you talking about and stuff like that. And one other part that I like that's so true is the part that when you took the man and there was the tall man and the lady and, the, and he was trying to seem like he's giving you a little hard time with that situation. And sometimes that occur a lot and it doesn't make things happen. But you were so consistent, and that was beautiful. He got your hook because when you came back, he was ready for you to give you good news. And those are the things that keep and help people get help. It's no joke. It's hard work out there. It's really hard to get somebody into an apartment. You do have to work with them. Your movie is amazing. I wish it goes all over. I hope it goes to the library because people need to know the factor of helping others that cannot help themselves. You know, it's very important for, it's very important for us to, I mean, uh, thank you very much. Uh, there is a... Um, so, I, I guess a, a couple of things. One, I just really want to commend you guys for such a hard a uh, movie that hits so many different aspects of the different facets of what's going on in the homeless, and it was amazing. And I want to be able to uh, show that to a lot of people, and I was wondering if you could put up there uh, uh, somewhere that where we could uh, access that, and if there's any other, um, you know, places to, uh, you know, to maybe I don't like it or something so that it gets out into the world. 
Yeah, yeah I can do some. I can do some publicity here. Uh, so the film is available on Amazon Prime. It's available on Vimeo, and it's also av available on uh, YouTube. Um, you can go on our web page, advocatesfilm.com, and you can find all the information where the film is distributed and, and shown. Uh, but thank you for your compliment. Appreciate it. And we're playing also, if, if people are interested, you have friends, uh, the film also sh is shown uh, Sunday at 6.40, at the Regal 12 in the, for the downtown Los Angeles Film Festival. So if you, have, uh, if you want to see it again, you can go back and uh, see it on, uh, on Sunday. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, thank you for a beautiful and inspiring film and to the two gentlemen for your work. And I have a, a question. We know, we have heard about what's going on with the HHH money and the difficulty of getting that housing built and the challenges that they've had. What's going on with the H money, as you know? Is it being deployed? Are those things that we wanted to see happen, are they happening? Uh, thank you. Well, first, good evening, everybody. It's a really big privilege to be in this space. Um, I want to preface everything before I say it, that in the few chances I've had to be on panels with Mel and with Remy in audiences throughout LA, it hasn't been an opportunity till tonight to be in what I think is a home audience. Like, I feel like I'm in a space surrounded by people who probably feel and uh, are motivated by much of the same factors we are. To the woman who spoke a few minutes ago, I really do thank you for sharing that very personal piece. And also know that, again, uh, we represent an army of people, not just in Skid Row, but in other parts of LA, that are desperate for something different. I, to answer the question with regard to H, I think it's important to understand that you can ask this question in any different part of the city and the response you're going to get is going to be quite varied and very different. There are still sections and very large chunks of the city that are only barely now starting to see even the slightest increment of services that have never existed there. And then there are sections of the city like the one in Hollywood where I'm presently at where there's uh, streets inundated with staff that are expected to do much of what you saw me doing up there. I think the other piece with regards to H has to do with the idea that the distribution of services for H must be equally distributed into parts of the community that have been ignored for 40 years and sections of the city that because of either the language barrier or color of the skin have perhaps never ever had the privilege of receiving those types of services. We shouldn't necessarily be focusing on tourism and on places that are high profile it's important for us to remember that there are sections of the city that were burned twice and have never been repaired. So I want to just add that personally. The other piece I want to add is that in H, as I see it from the team I have deployed that does outreach in Hollywood, I have access to a nurse, I have access to a substance abuse specialist, I have access to a peer counselor who's experienced homelessness himself or herself. And for me, after having done this work for 20 years, it's a huge step forward. I used to go out with volunteers. I used to go out with a nun and a retired you know, worker. And now the idea that I can go with someone who can actually put medicine in the field or give a person some kind of control over their destiny is a really meaningful thing that's provided to us. So it's not to necessarily badmouth the thing. I wish it could be spread more equitably. But what it has provided in the spaces I've seen is incredibly forward thinking. Can I, can I switch? Thank you. Actually, um, uh, thank you for that answer, Rudy. I completely agree. And one thing that we do, uh, like, we do like to bring some focus into is all of you guys have heard about LA Hop, right? Los Angeles Homeless Outreach Portal. So when you track all the tickets that are being put on LA Hop, you know, you get very few when it comes to Skid Row, when it comes to South LA, where there have been, you know, historic uh, poverty. But you get way more tickets put in in areas where you go towards West LA and whatnot. So something we have to make sure and keep the discussion going is we have to make sure that these outreach services don't get centered around where the tickets are put in. Because you could get multiple tickets put on one person because there's 20 NIMBYs telling each other to call that number to get rid of a person versus one person down in South LA doing one ticket just so that uh, in the hopes of that person getting help. So in the rollout of these services, we have to keep the conversation going 
on how do we make sure, like Rudy said, that it's equitable to every area of LA. And when you look at places like South LA, you know, they're way far behind on how many services they're getting versus uh, the rest uh, of, of the parts of LA. Okay. Uh, so one of the parts of the movie that was the most interesting, because basically you're looking at like a, a year and a half ago or so, is uh, Selena, is that housing work? When she's sitting there after the Measure H discussion saying, yeah, I remember years ago when all this money was released to change mental health care, but then it just got absorbed by the county, normal services, I don't want to be Debbie Downer. So, you know, here we are a year and a year and a half later in terms of what's happening right now as opposed to a year and a half ago. Are there, you know, breakthroughs that you've seen? Are there trends that you see that are encouraging? Are there trends that you see that are discouraging? Is there stuff that you would have thought would have happened by today, but it still hasn't happened yet? So, I think, um, oh. One of the things, thank you for the question. One of the things I want to remind everybody, and I feel foolish saying this because I realize many of you are already aware of this, um, that in the year and a half since that was shot, we have been uh, witnessing a variety of different things in Los Angeles that have changed the dynamics of how we do the work. I think one of the things we've seen is that for the last at least five to 10 years, we've looked at a movement towards housing first. The idea that rather than building shelter, we need to build housing and build affordable housing with sustainable services to keep people housed. But then this rush to, let's say, remove people from the streets has forced another aspect of our politicians to s select the idea of shelter again, in that bridge housing is now suddenly being seen as the way to go to at least reduce the numbers on the street. I want to remind everyone here that in a year and a half, we have basically, desperately, collectively all tried to do undo 40 to 50 dec uh, years of bad policy of a lot of planning that led to this storm that we're in right now. Uh, the piece for me personally that I find somewhat challenging, and if Selena was here, I'm sure she could articulate this far better than I can, is in that the decisions that are made are often not necessarily in tune and at least agreeing with each other consistently enough for us to demonstrate that we're doing something. There is so much to be said about all the armies of people who've been hired and who are now present in places where they weren't before. But if we have this tendency to say, let's spend this money to build these spaces, which it's dedicated for through Triple H money, but we're also taking some amount of resource that could go towards stabilizing folks to also say, we also need to urgently reduce the numbers in this area. So let's build a space for 75 people in an area where there's over 2,600 people homeless. It's a little bit of a contradiction that often frustrates us. I'll speak openly, and I realize that this is not like, I'm not in front of a therapist, and I shouldn't be venting, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> but one of the issues, too, has to do with the idea that um, I it's wonderful to think that through a hop app, a team of people like me will go out to meet an individual to introduce ourselves. But I think, ma'am, the first one who spoke here tonight, will remind you that in these scenarios that you saw in the movie, I didn't have a breakthrough with these individuals until I spoke to them for the eighth, twelfth, or thirty-second time. And the idea that you can just send a stranger to meet someone and say, hi, you don't know me, but could you give me the last four of your social and your date of birth, and by the way, get in a van with me, is a little scary, right? The other side of the angle has to do that if it's not me responding to the individual, more than likely it will be a Los Angeles police officer. And without a level of training or understanding about mental illness or what a person's gone through, the options between me and the cop aren't necessarily that great. One of the things we have to recall or remember, at least for us in this year and a half since it's happened, is that it will take much more than a year and a half. And it'll take at least 10 times as many people as we presently have. But what it will require is a consistent strategy that doesn't necessarily bend to the wishes of people who suddenly don't want people sleeping on their lawns. So again, it is a very challenging and daunting piece of it, but again, I am motivated by the fact that it's not a small handful of us anymore. There's a lot of us doing this. And I'm sure I missed some pieces if you guys want to. I think one of... Thank you. In 
the last year, I think for me, one of the things that I saw that definitely showed a lot of promise was the fact that of the Triple H money, the last 10 percent was allocated towards innovative housing approaches. And now we're seeing a lot of housing approaches that are also looking at shared housing and how to expedite the process, use infrastructure that's already there and get people in faster and um, at a much less economic cost. So yes, we do need uh, the individual units of supportive housing for the people with the highest acuity, but we also definitely need to look at innovative housing approaches where we bring the cost down and the timeliness of building it. So I think that is definitely something that, unfortunately, was the last 10%. But hopefully that 10% will also create a trend going forward, which shows proof that, okay, this can be done in a much faster and economical way. Yeah, one thing that Rudy said that's important, it's going to take much more time than one year and a an half and much more resources. So we have to be careful as, as community members that not expecting, because we, we voted Triple H and H, to expect results for tomorrow morning. It's going to be taking a lot of time. As from outside a little of uh, the, the, the system, um, as a witness, what I've seen, and I've seen that since I started the film, actually. When I started the film, I started, I felt like I was riding a wave, uh, and, and this wave has grown. And I, even after H and Triple H, this wave is really carrying, and, and that's what I'm seeing as, as an outside witness is a lot of people going in the same direction, and that is very encouraging. I saw a question at the end over there. Ah, first here. Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, I just get the mic. Yeah, first of all, I really enjoyed the film. It was great. Um, I volunteered in Skid Row. I've been volunteering for like eight years. I'm like getting tears just thinking about this, but I love your patience. It's incredible. It's so inspiring because I'll be in Hawaii um, to be with my 11-year-old son, and I'll be working as an outreach worker, hopefully with IHS. Um, but one thing that I do want to bring up is that, yeah, we have Triple H. Yeah, we have the beautiful politicians throwing out their spiel, giving off high fives in front of the camera. But the reality is, and I would love to see a part two of this, the part two is how these politicians and how these developers and how the powers that be go and basically criminalize the homeless. You know, you see how Rudy is talking about um, these measures that they want to um, institute shelter policies, sort of like concentration camps in a way. If you get back to Nazi Germany where, you know, you're forcing things on people, this is the only avenue out. Um, you know, you got Mark Ridley Trump talking, um, excuse my language, bullshit. And to conclude, we can't wait on these politicians, you know, to give their little re-election policies. We have to go out and do what you guys are doing and continue to do that because really that's, that's the only thing that's been really working. And yes, we have the, um, the populace supporting homelessness, great. But it's going to take the effort of the same, the same population and the voters taking out these bastards like Mark Ridley Trump, who are really out to criminalize the homeless. Um, I'm going to answer that one first and then give it to you. I mean, one thing I want to say, and I don't want to defend politicians here, but what we have to realize is there are as many people outside who are against any solution to homelessness and really do not want to see people sleeping in the streets calling the politician every day. And it's a lot of phone calls they receive and they have to listen to them. So. Uh, I think, and one thing that I've learned during this film is as a community member, we have to get, engage in our community. When there are meetings, and there are meetings speaking about homelessness, very often, 95% of the people attending the meetings 
are against any solution for homelessness. They just want to see them out. And the politicians have to react to that. It's part of their job to listen to them. Our job as community members, we have to go into those meetings and defend our point of view and advocate for the people and speak louder than the people speaking against any solution. Do you want to? I wanted to say thank you. I thank you for the comment that you made. I think I'm going to just say it briefly because I I told myself before I came in here that I wasn't going to just like talk about dark clouds and storms. I was going to try to share some positiveness, but it's very difficult to do so in the present environment that we're in for a variety of reasons. Obviously, the issue of homelessness as it relates to affordable housing and as it relates to people's health is very much on the forefront of how we view this thing. But we also have to realize that the way we've enforced drug policy in the country, on top of the fact that the gap between the very rich and the very poor continues to grow, starts to create this storm around us that has the potential to be rather catastrophic. You know, people can say, wow, 50,000 homeless, 60,000 homeless. We recently learned by way of economic roundtable locally that there were about 600,000 Angelinos that used 90% of their monthly income to pay the rent. So just think about that, 600,000 Angelinos using 90% of their monthly income just to pay the rent. And that if we had a sudden earthquake or a change in the stock market or something suddenly gave, the population of homeless that we're talking about, 60,000, could go to half a million. So please consider that. Please also consider the fact that the issue when I started doing this was completely out of sight and out of mind for Angelinos. The only time any of us who live in the suburbs, I grew up in a suburb in Alhambra, in the San Gabriel Valley, the only ever time ever I saw a person experiencing homelessness was when I was getting on the freeway or getting off the freeway. Mind you, they were in Skid Row, but I very rarely saw them in the streets of the neighborhood where I live. I don't have to go more than two blocks from where I live now to find an encampment. And I think it's not just relegated to Alhambra. I think if you talk to people along the Arroyo Seco all the way up to Eagle Rock, and if you talk to people through Frogtown and pieces of the city that never ever had encampments, you'll see how much this has grown. But it's grown to a point now, and let me just be frank, I hate to be this morbid, that it's not just the idea of finding the encampment or seeing people in places that they're not supposed to sleep in. But I was telling my colleague in the back, Jerry, that um, it's now the fact that the teams I represent more and more frequently are coming across death, in that the average life expectancy of a chronically homeless person in the United States is 46. And any time after the age of 46, essentially when you're sleeping on the streets without a place to go to the bathroom privately or without a meal every day, exposes you to the possibility of death. And the team that I represent in Hollywood from January to the present has had 24 deaths encountered on the streets. I go to the point where it's the idea that your, your sister and her kids or your neighbor and their child will be walking to school one day and quite possibly will pass an encampment where a person's been deceased for about 10 days. And if there is nothing stronger than the statement I just said to motivate our electeds and ourselves as citizens to realize that this notion that we're clinging to, that everybody needs a two-car garage and a lawn and a backyard and a swimming pool is not reasonable. We have to look at ourselves and realize that we must change what we think is a way for not just ourselves to live, but ourselves as a community and as an entire population. And I'm not suggesting, again, I, I hear myself speak and my mom would be rolling in the grave because she hated communism, but I don't know. I don't know how else to say it, but part of it is that we must really, really look at this collectively and not just put it squarely on the shoulders of a LASA or a mayor or an MRT. I love that thing, yeah. But we have to consider that each and every one of us here has some part of it in order to share the responsibility for it. And uh, sustainability will ultimately decide and determine whether or not we get out of it. The last thing I'll say, because I know I'm ranting, is that I find this hard to say, but there's Olympics coming, right? And I often think about what this issue that we're all involved with looks like as we get closer and closer to Olympics. And it's not that there's a clicker or a timer or a sand clock magically determining the end of this, where we suddenly begin to warehouse individuals in Lancaster. However, I can't help but wonder what change will take place before we actually do something really meaningful. That was very positive. <laughs> <laughs> Mel, do you want to add something on this? <laughs> you have a question. Have a, question. Uh, a question over here, Wait. yes. It's all good, I have patience. Um, my question is, there are some of us who are not necessarily politically savvy, especially when it comes to languaging 
and I know there's at least one activist up there. You all three are activists, but I know there's one that I follow and look for languaging. My question to you at this point is that Measure H is currently up for how are they going to spend the money for the next three fiscal years? And those of us who are attending that are feeling extremely morbid and upset because trying to get through to the people is not even being done by the customer service providers who supposedly help those of us who have been or are on the streets right now. Do any of you have any wording for how we can approach the team that is facilitating these Section 8H, excuse me, um, speeches that are going on, one of which I have to attend in the next day or two, and what kind of language can we as the lay public utilize because not even the customer service providers are getting through to these people. Thank you. Madam, do you want to answer this question? I have one, I have one very, very easy that I think is going to sound, it's going to make me sound like a dinosaur. But when I consider how long I've been doing this, one of the things I have access to now that I never, ever had access to was the idea of organization by way of the computer and social media. One of the things that I see now is that the coalitions that I thought were very limited to just the neighborhoods that I worked in are slowly spreading like wildfire throughout the area. And more often than not, these coalitions are made out of residents, people who were experiencing homelessness themselves. And you'll laugh, but from time to time, some representative from some council office who's really compelled to want to do something. I really urge the citizen of this city to really take notice that in his or her zip code, they will find that there is a coalition that speaks and tries to create a voice. And don't laugh, even if it's as small as a neighborhood council, it may be as large as an entire coalition of, let's say, hundreds of people that move to do something like, let's say, feed people on weekends and clothe people, but also to create a voice and to create a statement that is incredibly intimidating to an elected official who knows that he's up for re-election again soon. And if this voice is large enough, let's not forget that H and Triple H were passed with 74, 76% of it. I'm fearful of the pendulum swinging the other way so that all of a sudden we see a 74, 76 saying, sure, let's house people or let's stick them in camp somewhere. However, by communicating via social media and knowing what's around you, you begin to take a very small step towards really providing a voice that amplifies yours much louder. I think uh, on that, that's a really good question because when we look at what's going on and what's a langu language involved, it sometimes it's you know things that are very foreign to us, like you know we haven't heard of whatnot. But um, like Rudy said, but um, also like there's groups like Hollywood Ford and other groups who are on the forefront of pushing sustainable, effective methods. Whenever you get a chance, attend those kind of meetings. Because that's where you're going to learn not just the lingo, not just the methods, but why exactly these methods work. Like one of the programs in Hollywood, the first 14, yeah, top, first four, uh, top 14, you know, they're, they're trying out new things. And one thing we, if, if we've ever learned is like what wor worked last year or the year before might not work this year. So these kind of programs which are right at the front with, people like Rudy and other outreach workers who are on the street daily, those are the ones that are going to give you and me uh, the understanding of what we need to do, what we need to advocate for in the future. Great. You wanted to ask a question. Uh, my name is Su Hin. Uh, from, uh, I'm also from a community. I've been working around downtown LA for the last 30 years, since 1980s. That's a true question, a great movie. I met many organizations, I also was organization, community organizations. There's some things maybe I also want to see that there's a couple of things I want to ask, but also could be a tough question. Number one is, everyone knows, around this neighborhood, since the 80s, when I was in helping a couple of friends from across the street, Mojo motels, now it's all gender five. Now around here, it's become hippie joint, this neighborhood. And also the rent has been skyrocketing high getting higher and higher. At the beginning of the movie, you said that very clear. One of the reasons why LA City has so many homeless people, same as around the US, is because the in crazy increase on the rent. There's no rent control in LA City. So that's one of the biggest, one of the problem. People are homeless, almost a couple of times homeless uh, because of that. 
But in downtown LA, that's become more serious issue because not just only because the gentrify rent is getting higher, but also kicking out many people out from the downtown LA used to with living in a voucher motel to become a homeless. And we can't do anything about it. So HHIH, the money is good, but just only tip of iceberg. And just only, just, I feel just like a, just a uh, balance it back. People got kicked out, homeless, and go, just going back to help them. That's really not solving any problem. That's the reason why LA Times, although I'm not, I agree with them 100%, keep, bang, keep banging the, the cities, not doing anything. The homeless crisis is getting worse and worse. So number one, how much effective you're going to see? Because I now see that even the Highland Parks I used to be, I mean, I have many friends and I just run to Highland Parks because uh, uh, just a typical example, or my Pico Union because the cheaper rent, now it's gentrified and getting higher and higher and they got to kick out very soon. So that's become a problem. That's question number one. Number two is the uh, H, same thing. I'm from community organization. I know many community organization in a skid row offering service, but never got any bucks from the city. We're all getting uh, from donations. From uh, There's always a competition of the money. And uh, some people can get it, some people don't get it. And, uh, and that's the way it is. And then how are you going to solve this problem? Number three, it's not nothing hard feeling. I'm, just I if you, I'm going just to do something because we have limited time. So if you could limit your qu and just go through your questions. I'm just, uh, that's a two question. Number one is how effective are HHX? Number two is how are you going to distribute money to the organization and never get the money? Number three is I was thinking, it's uh, nothing to do, nothing hard feeling about it. I thought this meeting should be more people of color coming. It's still pretty white privileged things. On my things, I have been working in many organizations, still pretty privileged. And I myself never got any bucks from the community, never got many bucks from the city, purely privately donated, community donated work. So that's always how you're going to overcome the privileges. Thank you. So the first question is uh, how HHH was, how those measures are effective? Um, actually, I want to I wanna address something else that you were talking about, the gentrification and the rent. So uh, last week, the City Council of LA passed a temporary motion stopping no-cause evictions. Uh, this was done so that when the uh, AB 1482, the state rent control, until the state rent control kicks effect on January 1st, that landlords wouldn't be able to kick, kick people out within that time and give them increases. They came up with a two-month or three-month motion. The question is, how do we push this? And I'll tell you one thing. The day the city council met for that, I have never seen the city council members talk like activists that way. But the problem was it was for a three-month motion. The challenge now is how do we get them to uh, ban no-cause evictions permanently? That is going to stop all, everything that's going on with gentrification. And another thing, uh, we were discussing this with another group. When you think of how much money it takes to re stabilize a family who's been evicted, you know, first off, you get evicted, you take loans from everyone you know, you take risks, you might sell a vehicle that you use to go to work, you go into debt to stop yourself from going into eviction, but it still happens. And what happens then is you're already on the street and you have a debt to overcome to get back into an apartment. We have to look at how do you look at this in a sense where we do diversion throughout the county. If, if people are in trouble of being evicted, how do we look at, okay, maybe it's, it's the first eviction a person, a person is facing. If we can stop that eviction by giving that person or the landlord 1500 or whatnot to stop the eviction, when you look at how much we're gonna pay to get that family or person back into housing if they were evicted, I mean, you're talking about 1,500 versus millions. So that is a discussion, that is something that I picked off on what you said, that's very important that we have to talk about on how do we avoid it getting to the street so that you know we, we avoid three years of a per person being exposed to trauma, violence, by just stopping it in the first place. But how do you stop gentrification? Uh, again, it's it's by bringing in no cause, uh, banning no cause evictions. It's by it's by you know, it, Ellis Act. 
we need to look at how are we going to reform or get rid of the Ellis Act. You can't have people kicking people out just because they are going to say, oh, we're going to uh, we're going to remodel this. And, you know, now, right now, there's, um, you know, there are certain people are considering um, what you call settlements where if a landlord is going to, AB 1482, if a landlord wants to buy your building, remodel it, they can kick you out by giving just one month's rent. Good luck trying to do that because one month's rent is not going to help you when you need three months' rent to move into a place. So we have to look at, okay, again, how do we go from AB 1482 to strengthening it so that it's more strong and it actually helps people? What did you want to add something? No, I, mean, I, I, I want to do something terrible. I'm going to get killed. I, I, see, I know <laughs> you guys may not realize this, but another person in the film is in the audience. Jerry, I'm going to pick on you for a minute. Jerry Jones appears very briefly in the movie, and I want to say... Um, it, it's a privilege to have him as a peer and to look up to him as someone who is very much an, a voice not just that shares equally with all of us, but one that motivates other leaders in the city to actually listen and to take what he says seriously. And for some reason, when you were asking these questions, I kept thinking of him and thinking of the numerous times I've been privileged to hear him articulate, not just by expression what he feels, but what he knows colleagues in, throughout the city have also tried to say, because this gentrification piece isn't limited to just Highland Park and downtown, but we see it spreading quite rapidly in parts of the city where, if you all consider the movie, when you met Ruben and Yolanda in the movie, the neighborhood that you saw Ruben and Yolanda homeless in was the same neighborhood that he used to go to Little League in, and the same neighborhood where they went to school, and when they grew up and they had uncles and aunts and families. And I think it's important to understand that Ruben and Yolanda did not leave homelessness from Pomona or San Diego to come to Highland Park, but they were born and raised and they were multi-generations of their family in Highland Park. The idea that we were able to house them in Highland Park, I know it's gonna sound weird, but it's absolutely stunning because more often than not, when our teams find housing that's affordable, I have two staff that have to drive to Bakersfield six times a month because the only places we could find affordable housing were in Bakersfield. And when you consider that this is a person that needs to go to the doctor regularly, needs help getting their medication, and has no network, forget the idea of isolation and community. How do you replant yourself in a place you've never lived in in your life to say, ah, these are the buddies I watch movies with, and these are the people I play chess with? It's impossible. Let's not forget that it's not just the idea of rent and having a bathroom and having access to very simple human things. It's the idea that interaction socially, having a place you belong to where you know you're included, is just as central as paying the rent every day. And without those things, I don't know how much we can say that the folks we're housing are able to sustain their housing. I wanted to say that Ruben and Yolanda, I had to add this because I don't know that the audience does. Ruben and Yolanda are still thriving and doing well. And um, we're excited by the fact that we're gonna watch this quietly with them in a room rather than in a big space with a lot of strangers. I'm also excited by the fact that my boss was at a Trader Joe's in South Pasadena and Ruben was standing in line in front of him. And then when my boss said, you're Ruben, Ruben turned around and said, who are you? And <laughs> why do you know me? So I think that story is fantastic. The one that's really, really heartbreaking for me is that um, William died on the 26th of December. And that uh, he had a relapse and fell down a flight of stairs and died. But he was an incredibly beautiful soul that had such an incredible wit and had me rolling in stitches that Remy and I were very, very privileged to have known him for the limited amount of time. And it's also important to understand that he didn't die under a branch or in a van, he died in his home, and that he was at one point briefly connected to his two daughters and his uh, separated wife. He had a relapse uh, drinking and he fell down the stairs. Um, again, there's something to be said about this film that's really, really strong that I want to repeat a few times really quickly. I've been doing the front end my whole life. I've been going under bridges and rooftops for as long as it takes. But the work that happens afterward, I really strongly believe now is infinitely greater or more important than the work I do. The idea of providing a person with some level of community where he or she belongs, and knowing that at some point there's a routine that's very standard that helps this person feel like they're included is most important. Because without that, there's no difference between living in a tent by yourself on a hill than living isolated in an apartment where nobody wants to speak to you. 
So please consider that one small piece of this, and I know it's going to sound quite daunting, is the idea of making eye contact and saying, let's watch the game together. Something so small can have a huge, huge impact over this person's health and their well-being for a very long time. Yeah, and you forgot to say that Yolanda loves computers, and she's oh, yeah. taking computer classes. Oh, can I say one more thing that's really good, that's happy? R Remy hated me driving. Remy always was convinced that I was going to kill us in the car because of how lousy a driver I am. I could be on my phone, I could be listening to the radio, and this guy was always in the back clutching for life, but you're still alive with me, buddy. And I saw worst, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah now I... <laughs> yes. Um, I think, uh, really thank you for saying that. Uh, in the spirit of William, before I make my comment, uh, it's only um, safe to say that we can list if you can take a moment of silence before I ask my question. Thank you. Um, really, um, uh, I can relate to your um, story because I also do this work. And so um, it's very important that people realize that, that the work we do is about dignity. And it's about upholding people's dignity. Um, when society gives people's, when society gives them the name or the homeless, schizophrenic, we come to their lives and we acknowledge them by the first and last name. That is dignity. When society has labeled them all these characteristics and we uphold their name by looking in their eyes and shaking their hand, that, that handshake is worth more than, than what anyone can imagine. Uh, but it's also important for us to know that I'm glad that you brought up the Olympics because the reason why homelessness is such a hot topic is because of the Olympics. They are trying to um, sweep the homeless people away to the east side or Escondelo. The reason why they did the uh, Metro raid, the Crenshaw and stuff like that, it wasn't because they care about our communities. The reason why we're seeing public transportation, it wasn't because they care about our communities. Our communities still use buses. Have they improved the bus transportation? Who uses the metro lane. So let's be mindful about that. In Los Angeles, there is social, social inequalities, mass social inequalities. And so um, it's, not, it's not okay for us to talk about homelessness and then you have politicians criminalizing individuals. You cannot eradicate homelessness and then have 4118D. You cannot eradicate homelessness and and give people tickets because they're sleeping in their vehicles. So, so the politicians, and, I, and I'm glad you said what you said, because it's true. Like, people don't see the heart. We've been doing this work for 20 years, for more than that, and, and we owe our lives to individuals who have experienced it. Because Kali Kibran said, um, the smallest act of kindness is worth more than the greatest intention. And so I'm going to say that again so that people can, can, can understand it. Khalid Gibran said, the smallest act of kindness is worth more than the greatest intention. The politicians here have intentions, but they don't have kindness. You so know, I, I want to thank you for, uh, first I want to thank you for that minute of silence because um, <coughs> one thing I've noticed during the film is, and, and I've noticed that, especially when I was going to Monday Night Mission, where I was coming pretty often, is you, you are on the streets and, and you communicate with those people who are on the street, become friends. Uh, and, and, I, and I have to say that when you speak about dignity, it does remind me, and shaking hand, it reminds me 
all those moments in Monday Night Mission, very strong, where people we were communicating and shaking hands and exchanging crossing looks and, and asking how you doing and, and really being interested for 30 seconds to the lives of those people. But when I was coming home, you forget about what happened in the streets. And if I didn't go to Monday Night Mission on the weekend, on Monday morning, I didn't remember what it was. So for us, it's very difficult to, to really understand what the life is in the streets and to really be into it. And I, I really commend you for making us think about the 60,000 people who tonight are going to sleep on the streets. Uh, I wanted to end real quick. Um, I have friends who started an organization in the late 90s. And the organization was called in New York. It was started by a former homeless individual and someone who was very passionate about this issue. The organization was called Picture the Homeless. And their slogan, and I hope we can understand this slogan because it's dear to my heart as well. The slogan of Picture the Homeless says, don't talk about us, talk with us. And let me give you guys a quick example. I used to work in Skid Row in 2005 before the epidemic blew up. And our social services director, and I can still remember this, our social services director um, in one of our staff meetings said, um, hey, I believe that um, in order to address homelessness, we should have um, round tables and, and all the CEOs or all the executive directors get together in the round table and talk about how we can solve the homeless, all the service providers get in the table. And I raised my hand and I said, um, I didn't want to say his name, with all due respect, uh, where are the homeless participants in these round tables? Because after five o'clock, we leave. We are visitors in their community. When we work in them, we are visitors in the community. Well, after five or six o'clock, where are they at? So, uh, and then he said in a very smirking voice, like, well, Gerardo, where do you want them to be? And I said, w with due respect, we have to have homeless participants in every single round table. They should be sitting with the CEOs. They should be sitting with service providers because the only, the only way for us to solve this issue is by um, listening to them. We have to end this top-bottom approach and engage in horizontal relationships. I, I want to ask, actually, there is one question I want to ask Mel, um, and I'm sorry to ask that one, but uh, what gives you the ID and Monday Night Mission to get people online and call them by their names? So we had started Monday Night Mission in 2011, and uh, a, you know, in the beginning, it was we definitely noticed there was a disconnect between us coming in as outsiders and the people we were trying to help. And then um, one night, whenever we had extra food, we'd go into the courtyard of Midnight Mission and give out the extra sandwiches. So one uh, one week, I met this uh, lady named Laura. And then uh, a few days later, while we were in the courtyard, she was standing a little bit further away. She didn't have our attention. So I called out to her and said, Laura, and she started crying. And she was just bawling and bawling. And I like, what did I do wrong? And her answer was, nobody has called me by my name in years. Because she's been on Skid Row for a while, and she got lost within that population. And that's when it... That's when I understood, you know, I, I used to get a kick out of going to Starbucks and hearing, uh, hearing a person who worked there knew my name and being, oh, I'm recognized here. And then when I knew how that would translate to the people on Skid Row who have isolated, uh, we've isolated them from society and some of them have isolated themselves, that's when we noticed how powerful it was. So after that, our approach was greet people by their name. And we had this thing where in the front, like, you know, everyone one together would shout their name. And also when they were coming down the line, we'd have our volunteers shake their hands and acknowledge each and every person. And that by far made much more of a difference than any of the meals we ever gave. Do we, we, I think we have time for one last question before we let Remy, yep. Mel, and Rudy say goodnight. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I just want to commend you guys. Uh, it turns out I actually know Yolanda and Ruben from uh, Highland Park. I live in Eagle Rock. 
And uh, this, uh, no one could have been more happy and more surprised. We worked with them with a, tor a church uh, coalition, and so I feel like you guys picked up the baton, and I'm so happy to hear that success story. So I want to start with that positive. Um, I want to ask um, a, a different question. Um, so how can we as advocates, I'm an advocate in Eagle Rock, California, near Highland Park. And um, I commend you for your work. You're an advocate, right? You, you said, and there's so many, there's probably many of us in this room. But how can we connect with a larger group for issues of justice, for issues of um, continued attacks upon the homeless, which we witness? Um, and, and I'm just going to be frank here in Eagle Rock. It's not, anyway, this has been pretty much well known. There were some fire starters, started a big fire uh, in a, an encampment. Uh, to some degree, there's some speculation, even trying to maybe implicate those uh, that encampment. That started a huge. It was my birthday, so I remember it really well. Um, it was a huge, what, 40-acre fire. Sorry, we we can say the name. The person who started it was Michael Daniel Nogueira, Thank who you, still sir. has not been charged. Thank you, sir. We need sir. to make sure that name doesn't get forgotten. Thank you, sir. I'm glad that you said that. I live in the community, and I'll be honest. I have to be very careful. And, I, and, and, and that is the reality that, that's why I started with the positive. I was a teacher, so I know you start with the positive. But it, there, is, there are some really hard realities. And now that you've said it, I can say it. Um, Michael Nagara um, Jr. has a father who's a very prominent person in our community. He's been the president of the chamber for decades. Um, this started with a very clear-cut case of evidence for um, uh, arson and, and attempted murder. It went to all charges dropped. Uh, there was uh, video evidence. Everything was there. We were all like, great, finally, some justice. It all disappeared and went to um, continuing investigation, stay posted. And that's where it got dropped. This is just the most, I would say, you know, outrageous incident, but certainly not the only incident in our area. And as you know, working the work you do, uh, Glendale sends their homeless to us, as does uh, Pasadena, and, and all the, in the gentrified areas, Highland Park now. And we have churches who are trying to answer the call. I work with all these churches. There's many of them. How can we connect? Like you say, there, there's, I think there's, I think that, you know, sometimes we feel like we're working in isolation. How can we connect to a larger group? Um. That's a good question, but one thing I do want to emphasize is we, you know, last year especially, we would organize and we'd take people to different neighborhoods from where we were. Like, we would organize people, go to Venice, we went to Chatsworth on Tuesday. We were always labeled as outsiders. So one thing that's really important is that you try to organize as much as possible within your neighborhood council. If you have a homelessness committee about who's there, who's supportive, and have a local support base. Because some of the things like, you know, that have been really good that ha happened in the last couple of years is groups like Koreatown for All, Sila, which were representing in their neighborhoods. So if you can try to grow an organization within your neighborhood and then approach us, we can help you grow your organization or support you in your actions. But it's very critical that we have local neighborhood council-centered organization. Yeah, we, we're going to stay all around. I, I want to thank the Goethe Institute for, for having us here. Thank you very much. And, and I, want to, I want to thank also the uh, Skid Row Museum uh, for having us. Uh, they're, they're doing a great job in Los Angeles. And I will add that if you like the film, put us a good review online. <laughs> thank you very much. I would like to thank everybody here, Mel, Remy, and Rudy, as well as everybody that came tonight and to the rest of the events throughout the week. And please do, 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 do come to the Festival for Ross Good Artists tomorrow and on Sunday. And thank you, John and Henriette from the Skid Row Museum and Archive.